please join me in welcoming Dr. Renee Salazar, who is the inaugural Assistant Dean for Diversity and a Professor of Medical Education and Internal Medicine at the University of Texas at Austin at the Dell Medical School. In this role, Dr. Salazar leads a team responsible for developing programs to increase the recruitment and retention of individuals from groups traditionally underrepresented in medicine, which of course is a topic uh, very important to us as well. He is a graduate of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio School of Medicine, did his internship and residency at the University of California, San Francisco, and then completed a one-year Latino Health Disparities Research Fellowship and was a faculty member in the Division of General Internal Medicine at UCSF from 2003 until 2016. And we are delighted to welcome Dr. Salazar to join us here today. Dr. Salazar. All right, thank you so much for having me. Let me uh, start sharing my screen here and we will jump right in. All right, let me click on that. Um, okay, here we go. So, um, so first of all, again, thank you for having me. I'm um, very excited to be here today. Obviously, this is an incredibly timely topic for lots of reasons, and uh, uh, I, I do appreciate the folks just making the time to be here to listen and, and hear um, some of my thoughts about a topic that I've been um, connected with for quite a while. Um, you know, I, I have to say, one of the uh, silver linings of this pandemic, I try to find the positive in most situations, is the fact that we get to have these opportunities to connect across the country virtually. Um, and the, yes, it's not ideal. Deal. It does make it pretty easy, though, to, to, to have conversations uh, and to pull in folks from across the country. So I've certainly taken advantage of it um, in the work that I do. Um, and I hope that um, however this all turns out, that we continue to, to take advantage of these opportunities to connect, um, obviously, in person, but also virtually, because I think it's opened a whole new door for us moving forward. Um, I'll start with the usual disclosure. So I have no relevant financial relationships um, with any entities producing health care goods or services related to the content of this presentation. All right, so I've got a bit of a lengthy agenda today, and I want to make sure we've got time for questions. And I also want to acknowledge um, that uh, today is a kickoff for the Double AMC Learn Serve Lead meeting uh, that started at 11 o'clock Eastern Time. So uh, I, I'm getting texts from colleagues as I get ready to speak uh, that uh, the first speaker was fantastic. So I, I think it's going to be an incredible program. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about it towards the end, but um, it's a shameless plug. I happen to be part of the group of diversity and inclusion, um, and I am on the steering committee representing the Southern region. So as a Southern and regional representative to the GDI, uh, I've gotten the chance to really connect and work with folks from across the country, um, including steering committee members. And so there's so much the organization can offer in terms of education um, on, on this topic, plus many others. And so I'll uh, refer to that uh, at the end of the talk, but uh, please uh, take advantage of what's out there and I'll point you in some directions as we move forward. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple of things. I wanna start with a review of the state of the science uh, on implicit bias and, and, and talk about some of the gaps as we move through the conversation. Um, we'll talk about the impact of bias uh, on the clinical learning environment and healthcare outcomes. You know, I, I think now more than ever, these important conversations um, are resurfacing, and it's important that we take advantage of the opportunities, despite how uh, unfortunate they are, but that we really all start to work together to create a space that truly becomes inclusive for everybody. Um, I also want to recognize the limitations of implicit bias trainings. Uh, I'll share with you a lot of my own experience with this work uh, and acknowledge that there's a place for this conversation, but it has to be part of a larger framework. And that's where we'll wrap up is trying to think about how to move forward um, and not rely on just one element of what should be many elements as we think about the larger systemic issues that are a problem um, that have continued to be a problem for many, many, many years. And so my goal here is to get us to think about this, but to also move beyond that. I want to make sure that we think about how this is part of a bigger dialogue um, and how to not completely abandon a conversation on this topic, but how to make it more effective um, in the discussions moving forward. Um, so just a quick sentence about me, um, as you heard, I did a lot of work at UCSF before coming back uh, to Texas to become the inaugural assistant dean for diversity. I'm a South Texas native. I grew up down on the border of the Rio Grande Valley, Mexican American, first young college student. Um, and so, you know, it really is remarkable that I've had the chance to, to connect with folks, mentors, and, and, and people that really took time and invested in me and my progress. Um, and I want to make sure that we think about this message in particular as we think about the current climate that we're working in, um, especially as we think about our 
our learners, um, both our students, our residents, our trainees, and of course, everybody really, um, but especially the learners as we move forward. Um, because it's without sponsorship, without mentorship, that folks have trouble moving forward. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that out there because it's been a huge impact on my career. Uh, and I think it's something we have to make a priority moving forward. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations around the topic of implicit or unconscious bias. You know, it, it's obviously a topic that's been part of, uh, of of the work of a lot of folks for more than 30 years, but we're seeing in the last five years uh, uh, an increase in, in how this is discussed. You know, there's so much more awareness of this topic. There's so much more um, appreciation for the connections, but I think there's still a lot we don't understand, um, you know, from some of the more popular stories like the Starbucks issue uh, and, and their attempt to close down to de-bias their 30 thousand employees um, to things that we know have been an issue from the start, right? You know, thinking about the impact of bias, whether it be unconscious or uh, implicit or, or conscious or explicit. Um, you know, we, we know from years of study and research that this has had an impact, whether it be in healthcare, whether it be in policing, whether it be in education. Um, and it, it, it's an issue that continues to um, to become a to, to be a problem, and so I want to make sure that we just appreciate the fact that this is a topic that's well known, a topic that's been studied for a while, um, and it's just more recently become more of a mainstream conversation in healthcare. Um, so moving forward, um, I, I want to sort of just acknowledge that, but I also want to acknowledge the fact that we have so much work ahead of us, and uh, tr truly believe that the, the work, especially the hard work, is just getting started. <clears throat> So just to make sure we're on the same page, you know, when we think about this concept and you know, folks use the idea of implicit uh, and unconscious bias interchangeably. Uh, I you know, started off using the word unconscious, I've shifted more to implicit, but I just wanna make sure we understand we're talking about the same thing, right? And, and what we're talking about here are, are these, these hidden beliefs, you know, these ideas, these values um, that truly come from um, the world around us, right? And it's important to understand how these assumptions and these attitudes and, and, and these, per, these pervasive stereotypes um, can play out in so many ways, right? And we'll talk about some of the science that truly makes a connection uh, between how these implicit or unconscious biases play out in our daily work. Um, you'll learn pretty quicker. I share a lot because I think it's important to understand that as a clinician, um, as somebody who's been an internist for 20 years um, who also does academic administrative work, um, I have to be incredibly mindful of my own work. And it's been my own exploration and discovery in this process um, that I hope folks can relate to. Because oftentimes with these conversations, we stop, we think, wait a minute, is this really, you know, it, first of all, is this, it's a science even um, something that is um, you know, of significance. And there certainly are people out there who question it, and that's the direction they're going to go in. Um, we're going to just move beyond that. We're going to say the answer to that question is yes. But I think what's important here is to begin to think about how we every day can start to think about this differently and how we can perhaps make small changes in how we approach things, how we think about things. But more importantly, we got to be willing to pause for a second, open our minds and our hearts to actually think about how we're part of the problem and how I as, yes, I'm a Latino male who is gay. I also have white skin and I'm a male. So I navigate this world with a lot of privilege and power that I don't really appreciate. And so as we have this dialogue, we have to pause and reflect on what this all means and how it's part of a much bigger picture. It's uncomfortable. I, you know, people have gotten really uncomfortable. I've done versions of this talk for a long time now, and it's really remarkable to see where folks are in this conversation. Um, but I truly believe, though, that if we're not able to pause and stop and think about ourselves and how we're part of this issue, um, then we truly are going to miss the boat here and not make any considerable progress in my opinion. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind moving forward. Back to the topic. So you know, as we think about this again, it's, it's all these experiences collectively um, that, that ultimately have an impact on how we think about other folks, you know, other folks that are different from us. And it plays out in lots of scenarios, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, ultimately, um, the effects can be quite damaging. They can be quite profound. And I'll make the case for why this is an important conversation um, moving forward. And um, I think it's something that we need to revisit often. Uh, and again, I'll share with you why I believe that as we move to the dialogue. So as we think about this, again, just to make sure we're all caught up in, on the same page, I'm sure folks have been to many implicit or unconscious bias presentations by this point. And people are probably thinking, wow, OK, you know, we, maybe we've had enough of this. I uh, had, the, had a, the, the, the great fortune or misfortune of giving a talk to a few uh, colleagues in a different department a few weeks ago. And unfortunately, uh, before the session started, um, there was a hot mic and somebody didn't realize what he was saying. Everybody could hear. Uh, and, and I share that with you because um, I think people certainly have strong opinions about this 
work. Um, but again, it, it, it's truly important to recognize and appreciate the fact that this is an important conversation. The reason we're having these conversations is to ultimately create spaces uh, that are inclusive for our learners, uh, for our staff, for our faculty, and also for our patients. So as we think about why this is an important conversation, why you're in this space, the implications are broad. And so I hope that perhaps you can grab on one of those as you move forward in this discussion. Um, the, the challenge with this work, you know, and the first time I started doing this, this work was more, more than, gosh, a decade and a half ago when I was, you know, doing work with the UCSF curriculum, giving talks on racism and medicine, and we started thinking about bias and how it affected our work. Um, and I remember early on learning about my own unconscious biases and struggling with that, struggling with what I learned about myself through things like the implicit association test and that inconsistency with who I thought I was as a person. So this incompatibility is an issue. It's an issue that folks grapple with, uh, and it's an issue that, that we have to be able to deal with and move forward. It's also important to understand that as we think about this, you know, there are a lot of scenarios where this becomes a problem. And these assumptions, these stereotypes, these attitudes uh, play out in a lot of ways and they are more problematic and more likely to happen in certain situations, as I'm probably sure we're all familiar with. And then we think about situations where we're multitasking, uh, where we are in high stakes or high stress situations uh, when we have limited time. So if I were to pause for a second and ask us all to think about what our days were like, I think this describes our, our days, our weeks, our years perfectly, all right? You know, as, as, as a busy internist uh, that also does uh, the, um, administrative work, I am going from moment to moment wearing hat to hat and I'm switching gears constantly. It's hard, you know, it's hard to be able to focus at any one point. And so we are one of many professions that are a perfect setup where this can become problematic. I also wanna pause and acknowledge that we're gonna talk a lot about ethnicity and race as we should. This has been an incredible year for a lot of reasons, an unfortunate year, um, and we have to have dialogues around race, racism. Um, it's important because of just the, the enormity of the problem, but it's not to minimize the impact that this has on other communities. And as we think about the impact on other individuals and other elements of identity, like age, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, weight, and others, um, these concepts apply broadly to all these groups. And I'll share segments of this um, as we move forward through some of the science. Um, but uh, it's, again, it's important to, to, to not to remember um, that uh, this plays out in a lot of ways with a lot of different folks and particularly uh, in how we take care of patients and how patients treat us. And, and I'll share again some stories with that moving forward. All right. So I also like to think about my own story, right? So I shared with you, I'm down from South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. And you know, for folks who know Texas and know the Valley, uh, you understand that it's a, a very, very um, interesting place. I love being from South Texas and being from the Valley. It's about 90%, 95% Mexican, Mexican-American. So in the world that I lived in, um, you know, in my high school, there were no black students. And, you know, and so a lot of what I learned around individuals and groups came from a lot of different sources. And that it includes, of course, family. You know, as part of a large Latino family, family is a big issue. Right? And so we often connected. And I remember early on learning about different races and attitudes by what folks were saying around the dinner table. You know? But I also took in a lot of information from what I saw on TV. I'm thinking about how individuals from certain groups were portrayed. The, the classic stereotype of uh, you know, the black man in the hoodie who is perhaps a dangerous person, right? Even if we think about now how Muslims are portrayed in the media, right? And, and, and in entertainment, uh, as we think about how other individuals of the trans community, I mean, we just see the, the, the proliferation and the perpetuation of these stereotypes um, that if you can imagine, after many, many, many years of exposure, you begin to believe believe these are actually true and can become problematic. And now we're in a space, an interesting space, where there is just the multiplicity of the world of social media. And here's where this also becomes an issue, right? So again, we now have the ability to send messages, to perpetuate misconceptions, falsehoods, um, really at the flick of a button. And so it's a combination of all of this that I think really drives where some of these biases come from. And so as I remember doing one of my first implicit association tests, I really struggled with the fact that I learned about myself. I had a strong association, a strong preference. Um, for whites compared to blacks. You know, it was a hard fact to appreciate, to recognize, because I had just finished doing my health disparities fellowship, Mexican American. I thought, you know, no, my goodness, I, I, I'm not biased. This is not who I am. But then I began to realize that so much of my early years were cemented by experiences collectively that were all of this. Social media is more recent. Uh, I certainly wasn't very young when this came out. And so that's a newer part of the issue. But it's important to be able to acknowledge that, because if we're going to move forward from the disconnect, the discomfort that we feel from 
learning certain truths about who we are as individuals, um, you really have to appreciate the source, right? And you have to also understand how you need to be able to sort of shift from that to really be able to move forward. And again, in conversations I've led in this topic, you know, it's remarkable where people get stuck and where people want to perseverate. And it's often around this disconnect between what they learn about themselves um, and the suggestions that things like the implicit associations make around some real connections between um, bias, uh, whether it be conscious or unconscious. So again, remembering that and thinking about your own experiences growing up, I think are an important part of this conversation. And what I want to do is I'm going to give you a couple of examples now that um, I think, interestingly, and not surprisingly, reflect how this plays out, man. Um, and so I'm going to show a couple of snapshots here. And I'm going to start with the course catalog from, um, this is from the University of North Georgia. Um, I'm not sure if any folks uh, in the room are from um, Georgia or went to UNG. Um, but this is a, a course catalog, right? So it came out in the spring of 2015, okay? Um, and I'm just kind of walk you through it. All right, so the title is Success. All right, so we look at this. We got a great, wonderful course catalog on how to be successful. I'm super excited. Why follow when you can lead? My goodness. The issue, though, is this, let's just look at this photo, right? So let's just look at what we've got in front of us. Here. So I see four individuals, and the people that are winning this race are two white men. You know, they're dressed, looking pretty good here in that suit. They're looking good. Um, and I've got a couple of folks in the back. I've got a woman in third place, and I've got a black man. And if you were to look closely, you'd see that his face is, is pretty much blurred out. I can't, even, I can't even discern the features if we were to zoom in on that photo. And so the fact that here we are in 2015, that, that this, this, people thinking that this is the picture of success is problematic. But this isn't surprising, is it? Right? It's not surprising if you think about the messages that we continue to perpetuate around the ideal um, sort of, you know, person who should be leading a team, you know, as we think about these stereotypes. So, so, so here's, a, here's a wonderful example of how that sort of slips in um, to these types of materials that are constantly being produced, um, which unfortunately a lot of folks aren't catching. And, and that becomes part of the bigger conversation. So let's just think about this. Um, I, you know, I've done diversity work for 15 years now, and I've produced many different types of documents, materials, print brochures for the work that we do in the office, for the med school. Um, and if folks are, have done even any bit of that work, you understand that it usually goes through a series of edits. I'm working right now on my probably 17th edit on some data we're trying to put on the website um, around race ethnicity. Um, and so the fact that a photo like this could be put on a course catalog like this and nobody go, wait a minute, maybe we're sending the wrong message. Um, that in and of itself is problematic. But then if we were to sort of dive deeper and think about the root cause of this issue, I suspect that perhaps, so I'm going to make some assumptions here again, Mary Knight, assumptions are a problem, but just go with me, and that uh, you know, perhaps the team that came up with this was not a diverse team at all. Um, and so I think it's just a reminder, and this is what, five years ago, and if we were to continue to pull resources and look at these and how these messages play out, there's still a problem. You know, we continue to see these images, how individuals are portrayed uh, in a negative way, continue to permeate the airwaves, if you and, and it, it continues to be a problem, which raises a bigger issue around how to think about this from many different angles. But let's go back a couple of years and think about the Dove Soap campaign, right? So if folks may saw how this, uh, the, this, this whole thing rolled out. So a couple of years ago, Dove uh, launched a fantastic new product, right? And the product was, uh, it was a cleansing product um, that really um, was promoted nationally. And this was a product, it's a Procter & Gamble product. Um, and so, you know, they spent a lot of money on the national campaign to launch this product. Um, and if you think about how this works, I'm going to walk you through this photo and, and hopefully folks can appreciate what the problem is. But the way this is to be interpreted is that, you know, we've got a black woman in the top left corner, right? Um, and as you use this product, as you use this, you know, uh, th th this, you know, Know, cleansing product, this is what was going to happen to you. You're going to go from black to white. Okay. So again, here we are, 2019, 2018, the king came out at the end of 2018. And we've got a product here that is being promoted that is being depicted in this way. All right. So let's just pause for a second and think about it. And let's think about the message that we're delivering here. Now you would think, really, I mean, how do we get to a point where nobody can make the connection that perhaps what we're saying here, um, well, there are a lot of things that we could be saying here, but perhaps one of the messages being delivered uh, is, a, is this idea of 
the, the purity of being white versus the non-purity of being black. And the fact, again, that just to get through um, the set of eyes that allows us to push forward is a huge one. And it's a concerning one to me. And you know, it's interesting, I was giving a talk um, around bias to the leadership for the American Academy of Dermatology a year and a half ago. This had just come out, actually, and one of the women that was in that audience uh, was part of the board that is actually responsible for this campaign. And so we just got into an interesting conversation around you know the conversation that were happening around that table. And so I think it's an important part um, to think about because these are just a couple of many, many, many examples out there that I think continue to problematically show how this is a problem. Um, and so what the point of this is, is to remind us that we are being inundated by these messages, these perceptions, these myths, these stereotypes, pretty much on a daily basis. And it's not until we really start looking at concerted efforts to address things like this that we can really create change. Again, in, in, in the spirit of sharing my experiences with you, um, several years before I was leaving UCSF, you know, we were transitioning from a system that included a hospital and a med school, and we merged the two, and it became UCSF Health. We were so excited. You know, this merger was amazing. We spent a lot of money, well, not we, but the university did, on com promotional campaigns to really promote the system. Um, billboards, bus stops, it was all over the city of San Francisco. It was fantastic. People were super excited. The only problem, though, was that with that promotion, though, what happened is that every physician in those pictures was a white man. Every patient was black or Asian or Latino. And so, again, the fact that here we are in an incredible place that truly, I think for a lot of folks, thinks that um, truly understands these concepts, and yet for something like this to fall through the cracks and actually happen, I think reflected of how easy it is for people to overlook things. And so they had to go back, redo the entire campaign, and take everything down and put it back up with images of black physicians, with images of women, with images of women of color as physicians. And so again, that's an example that I think, you know, again, to have gotten that far in this process and not question it is a problem. So you know, as soon as I got here to Dell Medical School, one of the things that I created um, was a team where I meet with the, my communications folks every other month and let we go through what they're doing and what they're showing. And, and, and again, it's an important reminder of how we can easily perpetuate some of these stereotypes and it's happening within our own medical community. And so I want to just pause and you know, make sure that we understand, you know, th this idea of society and racial identity and, and, and the issue really is, is about the isms that are out there, right? So, you know, if you think about our identities, our own identities, they're not bad, they're not deficit or they're oppressive, right? For, for a lot of us, you know, who we are, our identities are a source of self-understanding, pride and sustenance. The, the issue though, is that the practices of different isms create these hierarchies that devalue people based on social group membership, right? So again, the, the, these isms, this hierarchy, um, and, and it's that particular issue that is, is really the root cause of this challenge. If you think about this um, in a different way, or in somewhat of a similar yet different way, you know, the question really becomes how is implicit bias a manifestation of the historical structural racism, uh, I'm sorry, the historical structural racism as a context for the intersection with social identities, right? And so we have to just pause for a second and think about how we as a society and as a culture uh, think about certain individuals. You know, the decades worth of data from the implicit association test shows that as a country, we have preferences for certain individual types, right? You know, there is a strong preference for the able-bodied, for men, for white men, for certain other elements of identity that I think collectively has put us in a situation now where we think all these other groups are less than. And so we have to really appreciate how we've gotten to this point. Um, because again, if, we're, if, if we don't really understand that, then it's gonna be difficult to really try to pull away from that and start to do the work that needs to be done to start to do the hard work uh, and the marathon that this is going to take for us to really accomplish change. So I, I just have to acknowledge that because I think it, um, you know, it, it's a broader reflection of how we've gotten to this point and, and how challenging this work has been. Um, and I think it's, it, it's also part of the issue where people struggle moving forward. Uh, and again, I'll share some thoughts on that in a few minutes. <clears throat> so Again, a lot of work's been done, and you know, the, the beauty of all of this is that uh, we've got some good numbers out there. We've got some good data that's looked at the impact of bias across a lot of domains. You know, we we know, and we're pretty pretty good now. Uh, 
in terms of the impact on things like daily interactions, hiring, evaluation, and patient care. And I want to walk through uh, just how some of this plays out to remind us all of the power of these experiences on individuals, particularly of individuals from communities of color. So let's start with microaggressions and let's make sure that we're on the same page and understand what we're talking about here. You know, we've had a lot of conversations around microaggressions, um, you know, these uh, brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or intentional, that communicates as hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from students of these microaggressions happening almost on a daily basis. So as we think about the clinical learning environment, as we think about um, whether it be the classroom or the actual clinic site, it's important that we acknowledge that when we send our learners into these spaces, that this is very much the reality that they're in. These microaggressions are problematic. And they effectively, when you start to think about these everyday insults, yes, a ton of feathers, or sorry, a feather uh, is, is a light thing, right? But a ton of feathers still weighs a ton. So it's the accumulation of, of, the, of these sort of microaggressions, these micro insults, these experiences that over time can really cause a tremendous impact on folks. You know, medicine, some of the ways that we've heard this play out is, you know, ideas around like minorities are hung up on race or, or you're old enough to be a doctor or one I hear commonly, um, particularly from my black and African-American students and my Latino students that they're mistaken for custodians. Several years ago, when I was at UCSF leading our diversity committee for the Department of Medicine, we had done a pretty good job recruiting a handful of students from um, who were Latinx and African American and Black. And on the very first call night for one of my Latina students, she was downstairs looking for the call room um, and was stopped by security because she was mistaken for her housekeeping. Right? And so again, you know, to go so far to do this work and yet to put our students in these spaces where these things happen um, is an issue. And right? we have to make sure we understand what that toll takes on the students. Um, and I, I, I can't tell you the number of stories I've heard. And I'm sure we've all heard our stories about how students, learners, and really everybody, faculty, as well as staff are treated. So it's really important to understand the impact that these are very real phenomena. Um, and the impact can be quite worrisome. You know, so we know from the literature that the impact of microaggressions on our learners, um, as well as others, quite honestly, is lower self-esteem. You know, we see an impact on depression, anxiety, and a trauma-like response. We've also seen links between microaggressions um, and anxiety and alcohol use in college students of color. And it also impact, has a, a profound impact on the fragile pipeline of women and minoritized physicians in academia. And so as we think about the work we have to move forward on, um, this was one of the many you know, and, and the problem with microaggressions is this idea of, you know, did that really happen? Maybe I'm overthinking it. Uh, and that's where this becomes challenging. But the connection between microaggressions and the bias discussion is that a lot of these are often driven by these assumptions that we make. You know, these assumptions that a Latina person is only going to be good enough for housekeeping and really can't be a physician. I can't tell you how many times I've had Black colleagues tell me about what their experiences have been like. And we'll share more about what that's like with a couple of stories um, in a few more slides. Hiring and evaluation. Again, we know from lots and lots of established literature that this is a problem across the board. You know, folks may be familiar with the symphony study, which showed that blind auditions when used as part of the symphony recruitment process led to an increase in the hiring of women. Right? So what folks did in the study is they looked at a shift in practice you know, prior to the early 70s. Most of our symphony orchestras were made of men. Um, and so in an effort to try to get more gender uh, equality, they started a blind process and all folks heard was the music and they never ever saw who was playing that music. And they found that by pulling in these blind audition processes that the number of women increased by 25%. And all they did was take away that image. We also know from lots of work that the impact of race uh, is profound on hiring process. One of the landmark studies uh, is one that came out um, by Bertrand and Melaniathan in 2004 that looked at the impact of race on hiring. You know, they created several resumes. Um, these fictitious resumes were identical except for the name. And the names were there were four different ones, Lakeisha, Jamal, Emily, and Greg. And they found from this particular study that despite being identical, except for that name, that the resumes with the black sounding names were less likely to be called. A way to interpret the data is that um, whites got called 1.5 times more often. So if we think about what that means in the daily situation, if you were Lakeisha or Jamal, you would have to send out 15 resumes for every 10 uh, that the white individuals have to send out. We see this in terms of sexual orientation in a similar fashion. Um, when studies have shown that when um, somebody identifies as lesbian, they're less likely to get callbacks. And, and this is pulled through um, some of the work that they've done in the resume study. Um, and so again, this is not limited to race and we're seeing it in 
across the board in populations that are historically underrepresented in certain groups. Um, and then, of course, if you think about the impact of this on women and women in academia, this is also an issue. Um, it's been well documented in terms of how we write letters of recommendation for faculty. You know, when we think about how we write letters for men compared to women, um, they're different. The reality of the fact is that they are. Um, I catch myself doing this all the time. I remember when I learned about this work, I was in the middle of writing letters for fourth year medical students, and I caught myself describing the woman student um, as, you know, she was nurturing, she was kind, she was caring, um, and the, the male student, um, you know, he was efficient, he was productive. And so, you know, these adjectives can be powerful, right? And, and, and what ends up happening, for those of us who are familiar with the promotion and tenor process and all the other elements that come with this, um, they can have severe consequences on how people are promoted, how people are hired. And so, you know, we have to just be able to pause and really appreciate how, how this seeps into our daily interactions um, and the evidence is there. So I think it's time for us to move beyond that and really think about what else can we do to start to address some of these gaps that exist and continue to exist despite knowing this has been an issue for more than a decade and a half. And then um, in terms of health, or I'm sorry, in terms of the medical school um, admissions, we also know this is an issue, right? And, and so this is an interesting piece of information. You know, back in 2016, folks surveyed um, people who were part of med school admission process, and they found that about 97% of schools believe, truly believe that applicants should be reviewed in a fair, consistent, and objective manner. However, less than half of those folks believe that bias could be a factor in their school's admissions process, right? And so we all know that that, in fact, isn't true, right? You know, we know how these interviews play out. We know how some of these decisions are made around admissions, whether it be to medical school uh, or to residency or fellowship programs. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that there's this big disconnect, this, this desire to want to be fair, consistent, and objective, yet the lack of understanding of our own assumptions and stereotypes and how it plays out um, is problematic. Um, and I think we have to do a better job making sure we understand those connections. And so one of the things that we do here at Dell Medical School is we do trainings. Every admissions committee, every season, we do a training, we revisit the data, and we make sure that folks really appreciate how bias plays out in these conversations um, and how just an increased awareness and a conversation around that um, can make a difference. Um, folks may be familiar with Quinn Capers from the Ohio State who put out a study a couple of years ago showing um, that when medical school admissions committees do bias trainings, um, it has a positive impact impact on the number of students from groups underrepresented in medicine who are ultimately recruited. You know, the, the difference was not large, but it was significant. And so I think it's a reminder again of the need to, to have these conversations and to make sure that people are aware of how this all plays out uh, in the process. And again, there's been a tremendous amount of work that's looking um, at the experiences of our trainees, right? Uh, and new, several studies have looked at the impact of gender and race um, in medical training from the AOA study that showed there was a disproportionate number of Black and Latinx students being admitted to studies looking at the impact of an experience on women. Um, this is an interesting study that I found which showed that when you looked at a group of women trainees in emergency medicine, you know, they all came in as interns with actually stronger academic records and, and, and you know, really, really, you know, just did tremendously well at the beginning. But over time, though, there was a shift in performance, and it ended up being by the time they were done with their training um, that the male residents were actually evaluated higher than the women. And so it, it raised some interesting questions around how was bias playing out to that one. If at the beginning you truly have an equal starting point, and in fact, women were doing much better if you looked at certain metrics, the fact that things flipped is a problematic one because I think for me, what that shows um, is, is the impact that this has um, on our trainees and ultimately on where they end up, right? You know, we, we've done a remarkable job bringing the number of women into medicine in our Dell Med School class. The third year class currently is 65% women. It's fantastic. I mean, we're really excited to have such a group um, that, that is so diverse in gender. The challenge becomes, however, that the, the road to leadership is a narrow one. And so we have to do a better job making sure we understand the impact of this, all of this uh, on people's success, on navigation, and ultimately being leaders in medicine. And so we've launched a few groups, including a Women's Leadership Council here at Domen, that from day one, we encourage our students, our women students, to think about this um, and to really engage with faculty early on and get mentorship so that can, in fact, continue to move forward. 
you know, the fact that right now in this country, 16%, one six, 16% of deans of medical schools are women is problematic, right? And if we continue to see that trend, despite the increase that we've seen in women medical students and trainees, um, then we have a much bigger issue on our hands. And so now is the time to do this work. Now is the time to have conversations around gender bias and its impact on success um, and breaking through those glass ceilings. And then, of course, thinking about patient care, again, we know this is an issue. You know, studies have shown, and you know, this is Janice Saban really, I think, summed this nicely. You know, we, we know that for more than 30 years, um, bias has been studied in their, how we make those decisions. And, you know, basically, it's um, we assess things so quickly that we actually function in our world. But when we do this, so we, we make these snap judgments. And I'm sure if we had time to pause and think about this, we can think about when in, in, in our days and our work that we've actually been uh, part of this issue. Um, and so, you know, I, I have to pause and just reflect on the fact that we've known about this issue for a while. You know, back in 2002 on equal treatment, you know, this, this profound report by the IOM came out that really, you know, identified some issue um, and was a call for change. So here we are 18 years later. And the issue is that we've made slight progress in public health and um, community health um, in some domains, um, but it's not nearly been where it should be, in my opinion, based on the amount of funding that's really tried to explore and address this. And sadly, the gaps that we've seen, the increases and the improvements in some groups have not been seen in all groups. And in fact, we're seeing um, some of the gaps widening, especially for Black and African Americans in this country. And so I think what we have to think about here is how this has played out. And, you know, obviously, when we think about um, health and healthcare disparities, it's a complicated issue with lots of different factors that contribute. Um, but where I think, you know, people are beginning to shift their, tent to their, their discussions and focus is how this plays out um, and how we as providers are part of the issue, right? So how we, when I walk into an exam room with a patient and I bring in those assumptions with me, it's going to have a profound impact on what I do next. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've caught myself thinking about a patient from a certain group in a different way. Uh, and I have to consciously make the effort to shift the work that I do to acknowledge this and move forward and not let it have an impact on what I do for that person in that room. Again, just to make sure we're all aware, studies have shown that when you look across race and ethnicity, um, that bias in healthcare is an issue. You know, it predicts nonverbal behavior such as eye contact and posture. You know, it has an impact on how we interact with African American patients, and ultimately has an impact on how patients trust and perceive us. Right? You know, and so as we all know, the importance of that patient-provider connection is one that just you know it, it can't be emphasized enough. As somebody who's done primary care for 17 years, uh, actually more than that, um, I understand that the value of patient provider relationships. And just to think about this conceptually, there's, there's a few ways that this plays out. You know, certainly in my own assumptions around a particular individual from a certain group will play out in my decision about how I'm going to treat them. My decision not to prescribe an opiate, say for one person compared to another based on their race or to question uh, and maybe be really careful if I do um, because I've got a black person in front of me and not a white man in a business suit, right? So that's one pathway that this plays out. But the other and the more subtle one though is how we interact with folks through that nonverbal communication. So I may think I treat my patients fairly and you know, may have an obese patient in the room and may order certain things and prescribe certain treatments. But if I'm approaching that conversation with my unconscious or implicit obesity bias um, or my bias towards preferring thinner patients, the ways it's going to play out is through my body language, my judgmental attitude. And so what ultimately happens here is that communication and trust with patients is severely impacted. And so I may order study X, Y, and Z. But the fact that patients don't feel this connection is going to play out in a way that they will not show up for follow-up. They may not follow through or they may seek care elsewhere. And so it's important to understand that these two pathways are, are both problematic because ultimately what it leads to is a disparity in health. So, you know, really appreciating that I, I think is an important part of how we want to do this work moving forward. And again, thinking about weight, you know, we know from studies, uh, we're seeing a lot of weight bias. And sadly, as weight obesity continues to be an issue, we're going to see this more and more. Um, and it's until we really appreciate this and we, 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 we grapple with the fact that we have a tremendous amount of bias towards obese patients um, that we have to be able to address, we're really going to have a hard time moving forward on this progress. And you know, we also see this in medical students. And so it's not something, you know, it, it's something that they're coming into this space with, but it's also something that continues to perpetuate as their students and learners go through the clinical space where these biases continue to remain problematic. Um, and finally, I'll stop with one study looking at the impact of race ethnicity on pain management. 
management. So again, an observational study from 2015 showed that you know when black kids were admitted to the ER, um, so these were ER departmental workers across the country, what they found is that black kids with appendicitis were less likely to receive opioid medications on white children at a rate of 12 versus 34 percent. Now, again, it's an observational study. There's some limitations here, but there's a big message that I'm picking up from this one. You know, the fact that we've got children with a diagnosis, that's fairly easy to, to confirm. It's not going to be something that's going to be a little bit challenging, like, you know, belly pain or back pain, which can be sometimes more subjective than objective. But with data, these were all confirmed cases. The fact that a black child was less likely to get opioids compared to a white child in the ER, this is not what they were sent home on. This is what they got in the ED waiting for surgery that we see a difference between 12 and 34% is huge. So I'm not sure how many of us here in this uh, meeting have had appendicitis and have had surgery, but I recently had a cholecystectomy last year for gallbladder and um, for gallstones, and it was horribly painful. Um, and I remember immediately getting that first dose of morphine because I was uncomfortable. And so, you know, it, it begs the question, why? You know, what is it that we're thinking and, and, and how is this playing out? But, you know, th th these are the studies that suggest that we are treating folks differently based on some assumptions. And so the next point I want to make as we move forward in this conversation is also just to pause and think about the impact it has on us as healthcare providers. You know, we're seeing more and more conversations around the racist and biased patient. And so I, I, have, to, I have to make sure that we understand that, especially as we create spaces um, and we bring more students from diverse backgrounds into the field that we work in, into medicine and healthcare, we have to appreciate the experience it has on individuals. Folks may have heard about Tamika Cross or Dr. Fatima Makoti Sanford, who are two providers who experience bias um, on a Delta flight. And so Dr. Cross on the left was on a flight back from Detroit. Passenger was not doing well. She was offering a help. A flight attendant stopped and said, not now, honey, we need a real doctor. And so she was dismissed. Um, several minutes later, a white man jumped up, offered to help. No questions were asked. Had trouble with the passenger, finally came back to Dr. Cross, asked her for her credentials, asked her a few more questions, and then allowed her to participate in the care. So imagine what that feels like. If you're in your fourth year of woman's health and you have worked your butt off to get to this point. And then for all of this to be thrown out the window because somebody doesn't believe that a black woman in 2018 can be a physician is, in my opinion, absolutely unacceptable. Do you think Delta would have learned their lesson? But then let's talk about Dr. Fatima Cody Sanford. A similar scenario played out. Passenger needed help. She was ready with her medical license, offered it to the flight attendant and the crew, um, took it back to the galley. They took a look at it, came back and asked her if this was really her medical license. They actually accused her of carrying a license that was not hers. So this is the world that we live in. We're seeing more and more racist patients and we're seeing more and more individuals empowered to show their true selves. And so as we have these conversations and as we think about how we want to approach this, we have to just pause and make sure that we create spaces that support your faculty, your staff, your students and trainees of color, because the world that we're in right now is a different, it's not different, but it's one that, that's just full with experiences that continue to happen on a daily basis. And I'll just share with you my own experience. Two years ago, I was fired by one of my own clinic patients because I'm gay. And, and so as somebody who practiced in San Francisco for 20 years to walk into a space in a city like Austin, Texas, that I thought was gonna be friendly um, and to be fired within my first six months of landing here uh, because of who I am was problematic and it was really at that point that I realized just how problematic this is and just how important it is to make sure we have policies and procedures in place that really address this issue so that everybody who's part of the experience understands that certain behaviors won't be tolerated but more importantly we need to send a message to our staff our student or learners and trainees that we support them and we will be behind them by creating these policies that do not permit this behavior and the beauty of this is a lot of schools are now doing this perhaps Sinai is doing this at your medical center um, but um, but it's just an important part of those conversations because we often get fixed on this idea that it's by direct it's unidirectional it's always on how the patient is treated by the provider it's always on how I, I, I treat that patient as a doctor but remember it's how patients treat us as well as well as other colleagues and support staff and so I can't tell you the number of times I've heard students share with me what their experience has been like as a black woman physician whose questions are being or whose orders are being questioned by nursing staff and, and so it happens it happens often it happens on a daily basis and so we have to just just understand the enormity of this issue and create these spaces for folks to truly feel support so i'm going to shift gears here um, and and talk about how we assess this and so 
you know, the beauty of this work is that um, it doesn't take, let's just say it's not rocket science. I'll start with that. Um, it's not easy work, but it's work that can be done. And there are clear ways on how to really make this a better place. And so in um, one of the most used instruments is the implicit association test. Uh, I'm sure folks have heard about the IAT. There's a link for folks to take it. Um, so it came out in 1988 made a big splash. You know, folks were really excited about it. This idea of assessing unconscious bias is going to be fantastic. And my goodness, we're going to change the world. Um, it's a time test, right? So you're measuring the time it takes to connect photos and words. And um, initially, the thought was that it was relatively resistant to social desirability. What that means is that it had an algorithm created so that you couldn't game it, right? And that you, you know, if you tried really hard, you know, it would pause, it'd make you start again. So the way it was set up was trying to minimize individuals wanting to get that right score, whatever that means. And so it, uh, here's a couple of snapshots. This is from uh, the landing page. You can see there's lots of options here that change uh, often. Um, and the beauty of this is that th the way it works is pretty straightforward. Again, it, it's just measuring these connections between words and images. And so a couple of years ago, I did an IIT with one of my psych one of my surgery residents. Um, and we actually did, um, an I we created an IIT to look at gender bias in surgery. Uh, and we wanted to find out the women surgeons, you know, were patients less likely to trust a surgeon who was a woman compared to a man. And we found that, in fact, there was a difference um, that patients tended to have more confidence in male surgeons than women. And it was through an IIT that we created as part of our office and worked with one of our surgery chief residents. So, you know, you can apply this to lots of different concepts. Um, and here's a couple of snapshots. Actually, I've got one from the race IIT. And so this is just kind of a, a, a glimpse of what this looks like. Um, the issue, though, is that IIT is not perfect, right? And so I remember early on doing this work, thinking, wow, this is great. This is, you know, we test it. Everybody do an IIT. Learn about yourself. We're good to go. And so it, um, it, it's not a perfect test. And, and I've learned from my psychology colleagues here at UT Austin um, that there are a lot of problems with it. Now, it's not to say it's completely um, useless. I think there are certainly a place uh, and a time for its use. But we just need to acknowledge the fact that um, it's, it's not without its challenges and has to be thought of in a way that is part of a much bigger approach to addressing some of this work. Um, and uh, people have even questioned the science of implicit bias. In fact, one of the strongest critics is actually here at Texas A&M, a couple hours from where I'm sitting, um, who truly has an issue with, with this whole concept. And so, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that. And I certainly think this is where we have to explore more of this. You know, and this is where I think some of these gaps need to be addressed. So, you know, does this idea, you know, does a positive IT really capture this concept of bias? Um, and I think that, that that's truly the, the big issue here. Studies have now shown that there's flaws of reliability and validity. And so, you know, they may not in fact be the same thing, but, and here's the important piece here, I think they can be helpful in a lot of scenarios. So, quick story. I remember many years ago doing the bias on weight, um, the IAT on weight, and I learned from that study that I had a strong preference for thin patients. Um, and so, you know, I was a little surprised. Um, you know, certainly obesity is an issue in my family, and, you know, I, I, I just, I, I dealt with that, right? And then really didn't think that I had a preference for one versus the other. Um, but in knowing that, I, I, I sort of tucked that little nugget of information in the back of my brain and moved forward through my day. Fast forward a month or two later, and I was doing round one morning in the ICU. Um, post call, we had a couple of patients, the second one of whom was a 600 pound obese male coming in for his fourth admission for respiratory distress. And you know, as the story started, um, you know, it was the usual scenario. Mr. So and so is back. Um, he's here again for this, this, and this. And I caught myself looking at him, arms crossed, already starting to, hmm, okay. And so as we moved forward in the conversation, I went up to him and, you know, I sort of stood over him, looked down. And my usual approach is I'm somebody who really likes to connect with folks when we could actually hug people and shake people's hands. Um, it's going to be a problem whenever we get out of this situation we're in. But what happened though is I, I caught myself sort of just standing above him, arms crossed. Um, I took the time to listen to him, uh, grab my stethoscope, threw it over his gown and listened to his heart. And we all know that, you know, of course, the best way to hear somebody's heart is making sure that stethoscope is on the skin. And it was in that moment that I caught what I was doing. I was treating him differently because I was uncomfortable with his weight. I looked over my shoulder and at that moment I had a resident, two interns and a couple of students watching my entire behavior. And I was modeling for them how I was treating this gentleman. When just the room before with the thin white woman, I had no issues at all. I sat with her, I grabbed her hand, we talked for five minutes, I examined her like you're supposed to. 
And I realized what I was doing in that moment because of what I had learned for myself from the IET. And so this is an example of how you can use these, these instruments in a way that makes sense, right? And, and so I really want to emphasize that point because I think there's some utility here. It's not perfect. There are lots of gaps. We have so much to study. But even at this point, though, there are ways to use this information about yourself that can make a big difference in how you move forward through your patient interaction. So I challenge you, you know, to, to do these, you know, these tests. Um, but use the results in a way that's positive, right? And also don't feel or, or don't be thrown by the fact that if you learned you have no automatic preference at all that uh, that you're off the hook because it really doesn't work that way. I think we all have to be mindful of how this plays out. And so it, um, again, it, it's just an example of how in my own work, I've been able to use some of the things I've learned through this work uh, in the way that I take care of patients. And ultimately it's about trying to be a better physician and take care of my patients in a better way. So I'm going to shift gears and wrap up with how, how to address this, right? And I think, you know, so, so here's my, my challenge. You know, as we think about, you know, all this work that we've had, right? Thinking about how we want to eliminate bias and how we're going to start these trainings. Um, you know, folks are familiar with Starbucks, right? And the fact that they closed down their stores and, you know, they really took a half day to, to train folks. I, I applaud the efforts. The question becomes, is that enough? And I think we all know the answer to that. And the answer is no, right? I think it's important to start a conversation, but it can't end there, right? And this is where I think we've fallen into a trap, you know, thinking that everybody's offering bias training for doing these tests. It's awesome. Yes, I'm learning about myself, good conversation. And then we never revisit the topic and we never continue to have that dialogue as an ongoing one. Back in 2013, I gave a uh, talk to the UCSF division of Gen Med, my division. It was part of a faculty retreat. I was given two whole hours to talk about unconscious bias, and everybody did a test, and we were so motivated, and we're like, we're going to get out there and change the world, and it's going to be a better place. Well, uh, that was 2013. We never talked about it again. I mean, we never went back because everybody was busy, and we had a full agenda for the next retreat, and so we really missed out here because, as we all know, something like this is a process, right? It, it, it's, it's something that we have to think about on a regular basis and it's not going to go away and it's that intentionality and that motivation that makes a big difference and so we have to just be careful about how we think about this folks also know the AAMC has spent a lot of time and spent a lot of money looking at bias in health um, and I went to one of the very first unconscious bias learning labs offered by Cook Ross when they were launching this years ago actually 2012 um, and so it was, it was wonderful but, but I think the problem became we started thinking about it as a way to solve the bigger issue so we have to just be mindful about how you know, this has to be part of a much bigger conversation. So with that, um, I'll end with some you know, ways to think about this. And, and the beauty is that this is pretty straightforward. You know, if we can kind of shift the dialogue, we can just be more mindful about those images that we see, start using photos of black doctors instead of white doctors constantly, it can have a huge, huge impact. You know, it's also important to recognize your own bias, right? Doing things like the IET are great. Understanding where these come from are also important and allows you to move forward. Um, and then again, several other strategies. I think one of the most important is uh, enhanced empathy and perspective taking. That can be really huge and powerful. Um, and and trying to find that common connection. Now, as an organization, again, I think the most important part here is just to be objective, to try to create rubrics that are as objective as possible, because without that, um, this is where this starts to get really messy. You know, if you're not clear about what you're looking for, then this is where the conversation shifts to, it's a good fit, or I just connected well with somebody. Well, the problem with that, though, is that if you have a space of individuals that looks the same, we're going to continue to create spaces that are basically the same. And so I think that's where, you know, we can become more objective. And I finally wanted to shift the, the final point of, you know, so how do we think about this? You know, I remember early on being part of a bias team, you know, we launched a whole training program, um, reaching over 1,500 folks at UCSF before I left. It was awesome. It was great. But I think we had it wrong because I think, you know, we thought that we were just going to come in and do this training. We we're going to be good to go. But we failed to miss the point that it has to be part of a much, much bigger conversation. And so, yes, you want to try to find a balance. You want to be intentional. Um, you want to make it action oriented. Um, but I think you've also got to understand, though, that there's a bigger issue here at play. And so I'm going to end with perhaps the most profound part of this talk, which is really understanding the impact of all of this on institutional and structural racism, right? Kind of how all of this plays out. 
I'm going to leave you with some directions that I'll point you in as we start to think about this work, because what we've got here is this is part of a much bigger conversation. Right? And we're now beginning to see a lot of work on how to address this. And so the AAFC just released a framework on how to address and eliminate racism. Um, and so we're seeing more and more around this at a time when we absolutely have to have this. So yes, this conversation is part of it. But where do we go from here is we just need to make sure this is part of a much bigger dialogue and not to rely slowly on a two hour our conversation, but to make it part of a much bigger program to really eliminate racism in medicine, which is the much, much bigger issue. And so this is all on the level AMC website, uh, which I provided a link. Um, and, and the way that they're thinking about this in this framework is really thinking about, uh, you got to start with that self-reflection. You know, when Mr. George Floyd was murdered in Maine uh, by the police, um, you know, people at my institution jumped on the health equity bandwagon. Like, they're ready to start changing the world by signing policies around language and really making a difference. Um, fantastic. Very excited about that but nowhere in that first conversation do we stop and say how am i part of the challenge how am i part of the problem and so if if, if we can't pause and think about us individually how we contribute to this then we're going to miss this mark entirely and so yes you want to start looking at the policies and procedures but we all have to start with, with where we are in this conversation and i still do this work every day thinking about it the anti-racism efforts with the AAMC, they're, they're looking at this critically and they're trying to address this. And then obviously there's efforts with the community, the medical community, as well as the broader community. And if you look at the website, it starts to give you a roadmap to really think about this. And bias, unconscious, implicit bias is part of that. But again, it's part of a much bigger framework. And then finally, I want to make sure folks know that there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, AAMC just put out the racism and health reading list. Uh, and you'll see the link down here below to that. And then again, one last shameless plug for Learn Sort of Lee, because as we move forward in these conversations, um, I think this is, uh, it's, you know, we're only getting started here. And I'll end with some final thoughts. You know, I've done this work now for, uh, my goodness, almost 20 years now. And, and I think, you know, I, I've seen this go on all directions, but you know, we're truly in a moment where I think we can make a difference, but people need to realize this is hard work. This is work that takes time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and we really have to be able to pause and think about how we're part of the issue. Be okay to reflect on ourselves, find the space to process that. But more importantly, it's time to take action. You know, and understand that bias is one of many things that we can do. Um, and so, for folks that have signed up to go to LSL this year, it's virtually, as you know, uh, but they've got some fantastic speakers lined up to talk about this. And so, I'm, I'm most excited about the framework for um, the anti racism process. So, I challenge you to think about that. And I'm at, you know, like five minutes left for questions. So, I'm going to shift directions. Um, you've also got my email address if folks have questions. But, um, but I'm going to pause. I will stop there so um if folks have any questions um we got five minutes so i'll stop talking <laughs> go ahead thank you so much dr yeah. salazar so we'll uh, we do have a couple of minutes left and then a bunch yeah. of us have to run to interview season so we'll entertain some questions either in the chat or if somebody wants to right. unmute themselves and and ask a first question Hi, this is Eve Merrill. I'm one of the hospitalists. It was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I know this wasn't the focus, but you did touch upon this. Um, how would you uh, suggest, you mentioned um, that you were fired by a patient. How would you suggest in the inpatient world um, that we deal with a patient who yeah. requests another provider who is a different race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera? What do you think is the best way to address that? Yeah, it's actually, it's a great question. Uh, and in fact, um, if you send me a note, uh, I'll send you an article that one of my colleagues from UCSF, Alicia Fernandez wrote that that talks about this issue in the inpatient setting. And so I think, you know, it, it depends on a couple of things. Obviously, if the patient's unstable, you know, we have a commitment to serve that person and get them in that place. But then quite honestly, you know, I, I think um, you know, gender is an interesting one because I, and I certainly can appreciate, um, you know, a preference based on certain things. But I think truly, though, if, if there is um, a patient who's just refusing flat out to work with the black physician, uh, then I think it's up to the medical organization to think about how they want to handle this. Um, and I think, you know, clearly, um, I have strong opinions about this, but I think it is not unreasonable to think about transferring out of the facility uh, if a patient is just intolerant and unwilling to work with somebody who is, say, a black physician. Um, so again, that, that that piece that I've just mentioned, um, I'm happy to share that with you, but it's got a really nice approach on how to think about this. Uh, again, making sure that patient is stable, but then, um, you know, we have to be willing to um, remember what that says to our providers. You know, it's the fact that, yes, I'm going to transfer somebody because they simply asked for a white physician. That means a lot to a black doctor, so we have to be willing to take that step forward to show them that we support them. So um, if you send me a note, I'm going to go back to my email address, but I'm happy to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to share that piece with you.
Okay. Thanks, Dr. Merrill. Maybe time for one more question out there. Just heard somebody on mute. Dr. Ngale. Hi, Dr. Salazar. Thank you for that um, uh, great presentation. Um, I had a question about sort of how do you handle when you catch yourself um, in a situation where there's bias at play, especially in teams, kind of the way you noticed it um, with your obese patient. Um, I recently had an experience where I, I was in interdisciplinary rounds and I felt the way we were speaking about a patient um, in that setting was, was inherently biased. And I wasn't quite sure how to handle it. For sure. Yeah, so I think so, so again, another wonderful question. Um, and I think it, so this has been, um, I think this becomes an interesting one because it really is about how do we find our voice and use that voice to speak up. You know, it, it, it's hard for students, you know, to be able to stand up and, and perhaps question something that's coming from a resident or an attending. But I do think though that we really need to create our spaces to just to be able to acknowledge that. And oftentimes it's in how you frame the conversation. Um, you know, I found that, hey, you know, just the circle back to this particular comment. What did you mean by that? Um, you know, trying not to attack the person, but more focus on the issue, the comment um, that uh, that was made. And I think uh, it can be hard to do, especially when you know. Um, you perhaps are the only one in, in, in the group who feels this way. But I think the more that we can start raising the issues, the better. And, and I find that for a lot of these scenarios that I've become more emboldened to speak up about, um, that a lot of folks are surprised and like, well, I didn't, I didn't realize we were heading in that direction. So not all, you know, a lot of folks, also, I've also been sort of experienced pushback. But I think it just begins with trying to find a way to to question the comment, uh, again, that doesn't focus on the person, but more on what was said. So, hey, you know, you said this about this population. Tell me more about what you meant. And that's kind of the way to open that door uh, and then really get folks to start thinking about it. Some situations, depending on the topic, the, the timing, um, it's also maybe better to pull that person aside and say, hey, let's just check in and let's sort this out. So I think it really is, is going to depend on the scenario. But um, you know, I, I would think that in a space like multidisciplinary rounds, but it includes social workers and you know, other folks who are also well versed, but again, doesn't always guarantee that they completely get it. They can also be powerful allies in these conversations. Um, but I think it, it, it's a combination of approaches. Again, trying to find the space is now the time I try to pull them aside. Uh, and again, for the students and the learners, the trainees, it, it's harder because of that hierarchy and the ultimate consequences. So, you know, but I, I just appreciate your willingness to want to bring the conversation up. And I think just taking that first step, as somebody who's done this for a while, I also realize how hard it is to actually pause in the moment and go, oh my gosh, this just happened. So I, uh, I ask them we'll find time to go back afterwards. And then I think finally I'll say, you know, debriefing with the team is also really important. We had a lot of this happen when I was ward attending and, you know, I spent time during teaching on talking about this and the team really appreciated this. So I think trying to find the space to bring this into our daily experiences is also important and sends a powerful message to folks that uh, this is important to us and we want to do something different. So, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question, Dr. Salazar saying thank you for this excellent, excellent uh, lecture. I right, um, have you. to go. It's 101, but right. I thank you for this. And the um, I know you put your uh, email address in the chat, so yes. I think you'll probably be hearing from you a lot. And I'll send the slides to Ryan as well, so he has them, so you guys right. have it also. But please reach out with any other questions. All right. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank All right. You see so you guys. Much. Take care.